welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Uh, We're going to do a quick little bit of housekeeping right out of the gate. So first of all, big excitement because we are going to Paris, France. Yes. Uh, And you, our listeners, have the opportunity to come with us. So uh, if you would like to take the uh, French Revolution tour that we are doing in June of this year, you can go check that out at our website, mistinhistory.com. And then if the, at the top of the menu bar, there is a, a little option that says Paris trip with an exclamation point because we are excited. And that will take you through to all of the information. And you too can join us as we run around Paris and go to Versailles. And I, uh, I'm i going to cry a lot. So if you'd like to watch me cry, now's your shot. Uh, <laughs> the other thing that we have is uh, just in case you didn't know or maybe you knew and forgot, we have a tea public store where you can get all kinds of goodies. Uh, You can get various designs related to things that have come up on the podcast on shirts and on mugs and on stickers and all kinds of other things. Uh, If you would like to check any of that out, please do that. You can also go to our website, mistinhistory.com, click on in that same menu bar, the word store, and it will take you right there, and then you can browse and explore. Uh, We recently had one related to our our ballet episodes that I think is quite a cute design. I didn't do it, so I feel comfortable saying it. We also have a Lunar Beavers t-shirt, which we said we wanted years ago (laughs) when we recorded the Great Moon Hoax episode. I actually had a funny moment recently while I was wearing that shirt. This is 100% true. Uh, While I was traveling this weekend, I had that shirt on and I was at the airport and I was at the airport bar waiting on my flight, getting a couple cocktails. And this man leaned over and said, you have to explain what lunar beavers are to me. (laughs) I was like, okay, where do I start? I have a podcast. There's also, um, okay, so uh, there are beavers on the moon. Wait, no. (laughs) Like, contextualizing that quickly becomes tricky. So if you buy one, prepare yourself a soundbite when weird, random strangers ask you what it is. Uh, I also had a friend ask me about it, but that was easier. She knows about the show. Yes. <laughs> uh, so we are now that we are done with housekeeping, that is the sound of me wiping my hands from housekeeping work, uh, we can jump right into today's podcast. Yay! So today, today's episode was suggested by our listener, Edward, uh, and he became intrigued with this story when he was watching a fictional version of it. That was a film called The Wind and the Lion that was made in 1975. It stars Sean Connery and Candace Bergen and Brian Keith and John Huston. It is a very fun watch, uh, but it plays with reality a little bit to make it more compelling. For example, the character played by Candace Bergen was, in fact, not a woman. Um, <laughs> but she's added in to create some potential romance. Uh, so without any embellishment or gender swapping of figures to create weird romance subplots, this story is fascinating all on its own. And it happened in Morocco in the early 20th century, but it impacted American history significantly. And it is the story of a famous kidnapping. And to begin, we will first give some background on the man for whom this whole affair is named, Eon Perticaris. It doesn't entirely surprise me that a fictional romantic subplot was totally made up to make this into a movie because that's the kind of thing that happens. But it's one of those stories where you didn't need to do that. It was plenty full of action on its own. (laughs) Yes. So, Eon Perticaris has a surprisingly scant biography for a man who had the wealth and importance that he did. He was born in 1840. His father, Gregory Perticaris, was Greek and was a naturalized U.S. citizen. He had married into a wealthy Southern family in South Carolina. Gregory Perticaris taught at Harvard as a professor of Greek language and lived in Trenton, New Jersey. He made a nice fortune for himself in the gaslight industry and eventually became the U.S. consul to Greece. Eon, his son, went to Harvard, but only briefly. It appears that he enrolled in 1860, but he decided to study abroad during his sophomore year. And this, of course, coincides with the beginning of the U.S. Civil War. It is unclear what Eon's stance on the conflict was, as his parents, according to the press of the day, were split on the issue. So according to reports that circulated during the kidnapping press coverage, we're going to contextualize the kidnapping later, but these things came up. Uh, Gregory, Eon's father, supported the Union, and his mother was a Confederate supporter. So during the Civil War years, Eon was sometimes at home in Trenton, but also spent long periods of time in England and Morocco. 
He also worked writing articles for magazines. And by the mid-1880s, he was living primarily in Tangier, in a home that he had started building in 1877. That residence, known as Villa Idonia, was also called Place of the Nightingales, and it sits on hills overlooking the city. And in Tangier, Perdicaris became a well-known member of the expatriate community. He threw extravagant dinners, and he lived a fairly free life in the way that an independently wealthy man of the day did, enjoying time with his family and occasionally writing a book or article. He was very engaged in the community, though, and he lobbied against diplomatic corruption in the mid-1880s, a matter which made him fairly well-known to members of the U.S. government. That particular case had involved a Moroccan woman who had accused a consular protege of sexual assault. And Jan Perticaris wanted the man prosecuted outside of a consular court. This refusal to give the woman any sort of justice led to him writing a pamphlet called American Claims and Protection of Native Subjects in Morocco. He published the pamphlet himself and had it distributed in London to try to get the attention of the European press. While the American consul who had protected the accused man was ultimately fired from his position, it was really only after the consul's office had waged this personal war on Perticaris for this embarrassment that they felt he had caused, which included fines and arrests and just general harassment. Yeah, he was basically like, if you try him in consular court, nothing's going to happen to this guy. We, this woman really deserves better than this. Could we actually try this as a trial? Uh, but they were not interested in doing that. By the early 1900s, Perticaris was a fixture in Tangier, and while he often traveled to Europe and the U.S., Morocco was really his home. But Morocco was not the most stable place. The events that unfold in this episode start a month after an agreement had been struck between England and France regarding the handling of both Egypt and Morocco. This Entente Cordiale basically recognized France's power in Morocco and Britain's power in Egypt. It was sort of divvying up the power in other countries. This augmented existing conflict on a couple of fronts. So for one, as the scramble of Africa had been developing, Germany had set its sights on Morocco for itself. So among the European countries that were trying to seize power on the African continent, there was tension, particularly because two of those countries, Great Britain and France, had just kind of decided between themselves to this plan, even though other countries had interests in both Morocco and Egypt including Spain, which we talked about in our Francisco Franco episode. Yes. Within Morocco also, there was plenty of resentment toward Europeans just strolling in and claiming things, not only because that was a jerk move, but because their own Moroccan sultan, Abdelaziz, was really making this matter worse. Abdelaziz had been sultan for 10 years in 1904, having succeeded his father, Hassan I. And he was only 16 when he rose to power. And Morocco had been ruled by a regent for six years before Abdelaziz came into his own as a ruler, which happened when the regent died. Unsurprisingly, that could be its own whole story and podcast. That is not the scope of this particular day's discussion. As sultan, Abdelaziz looked to Europe for inspiration and advice, He wanted to modernize Morocco and its infrastructure, and he wanted to change the way the tax system worked. This entire ideology, though, did not go over well. Initially, there was support for his reform ideas, but the execution of them was really poor. There just wasn't a system or administrators in place to handle all the kind of changes that he was trying to make. So his standing as a ruler started to look very weak to a majority of the people, especially the people in positions of power. Some of them felt like the sultan was trying to sell his own country to Europe. And to make matters worse, he had driven up the country's debt with some very frivolous spending on wild collections of things like bicycles and grand pianos and cars. And he was borrowing money from European countries to pay for all of this, particularly France. So when Britain and France enacted their Entente Cordiale, it really looked a lot to people like France was just taking possession of Morocco. Not surprisingly, the state of affairs led to a lot of conflict within the country. Not only had France suddenly gained a whole lot of power, but an ally, Great Britain, had just handed it over. So there was a deep sense of betrayal by the government, which had been working with British interests at various levels for a number of years. There was also a very real sense that a rebellion could erupt at any time, as numerous tribes and governmental factions were all jockeying for power. 
And we are about to get into the kidnapping itself. But before we do, let's take a quick break to hear from a sponsor. It was dinner time, May 18th, 1904, when the kidnapping took place. There were shouts heard from the kitchen, but this did not initially alarm Perticaris too much. Two of his staff, his French chef and his German housekeeper, commonly got into a lot of loud arguments, which Perticaris had to break up. So after hearing all of this ruckus, he got up from his dinner and he went to handle what he believed to be a minor skirmish between two staff members in the kitchen. And his family followed behind him to see just what had set this whole thing off. He did not find the housekeeper and the chef like he expected. He found men with rifles. Initially, the Perticarises thought these men were their own hired guards, but they were not. The men cut the phone lines to the house and used their gun stocks to beat the servants. Ellen Perticaris, who was Eon's wife, resisted these men but was knocked to the floor. And her son, Cromwell Varley, who was her son from a previous marriage, was beaten. The men were a group of brigands led by Ahmed El Razuli. And he told them so, announcing loudly, I am Razuli, the Razuli. And this was not an unknown person. Also, I am probably butchering that name. My apologies to anyone who is horrified by it. Razuli was infamous in the area as a leader of a group of very active raiders. Razuli had been in conflict with the Sultan of Morocco, Abdelaziz, who he challenged for power in the region pretty much as soon as he determined the sultan was weak. Razuli directed his men to saddle horses from the Perticaris stable and to take Mr. Perticaris and his stepson away. And with a gunshot to signal their exit, he and his men set off into the night, headed toward the Atlas Mountains, away from the main road with the men they had kidnapped. And before she was dragged away and the phone line was cut, the housekeeper had managed to get a hold of a telephone operator and ask for help. The housekeeper at the time, though, believed that the house was being robbed. She did not know at that point that a kidnapping was underway. But that telephone operator, in turn, called the United States Consul General, Samuel R. Goumer, to tell him that the home of an expatriate U.S. citizen outside of Tangier was under attack. Goumer, who had been in the middle of his own dinner, immediately went to the place of Nightingales to investigate. He set up a guard team to cover the house and did what he could to try to reassure the members of the household who were still there. Then he sought the counsel of his British counterpart in Morocco, Sir Arthur Nicholson. They agreed that the situation in Morocco, including the issues that had arisen after Britain and France had reached their agreement about who controlled each country, had been pretty tenuous. It made sense that Razouli would make this kind of a move in the middle of all that in essence, insulting the sultan as weak and as unable to protect the wealthy foreign expatriates who were living in Morocco. Goumer next telegraphed the U.S. State Department to convey the seriousness of the situation and to request military assistance. And in a way, this was welcome news. Uh, We will explain why. Because at this point, U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt was serving his first term, and he was campaigning for a second term. So, he took immediate and decisive action in the Perticaris kidnapping by immediately ordering a naval squadron to Morocco. This was the entire South Atlantic squadron. That naval squadron was headed up by Admiral French and Sir Chadwick, a West Virginia-born man who had been outspoken on the matter of naval reform in the United States after the Civil War ended, Chadwick and Roosevelt were men with similar outlooks in a lot of regards, and most importantly, the willingness to use naval force to try to achieve their objectives. The U.S. Consul Goumer received a response via telegraph that said, warships will be sent to Tangier as soon as possible. And that message also indicated, though, that it could take several days for them to get there. This was really not an ideal response. It was easy to think that Perticaris might not live that long. So no matter how many ships were coming, Gamera was afraid they wouldn't make it in time to save the kidnapped men. Razuli was known to be brutal. Gamera's fears were really justified. For one thing, Razuli had kidnapped foreigners living in Morocco before. A reporter for the London Times had been taken hostage in 1903, and he was released in exchange for several of Razuli's men being released from prison. But that was an unusually good outcome. Razuli had been in a long-standing war, for example, with the local governor, and he had been known to capture the governor's men and send back their bodies in pieces. 
To try to avoid a similar end for Perdicaris and Varley, the next step that Gamera took, along with the British minister at Tangier, Nicholson, was to reach out to the sultan and the government and to ask them to acquiesce to any demands that Razali and his agents made. Gamer was genuinely afraid that any kind of delay in responding to these kidnappers would directly lead to the death of these two men. But communicating with the government and the sultan proved to be a whole other tricky problem as well. The Moroccan foreign minister was in Tangier, but the sultan was in Fez, almost 250 miles, that's about 400 kilometers away. And today, that's a distance easily traversed by car in just a few hours. But in 1904, that meant several days on camelback. So Gumer and Nicholson spoke first with the foreign minister, Mohamed Torres, and each man sent a member of his staff to Fez to make their case to the sultan. Because France was so heavily involved in Morocco's affairs, the French minister was also concerned once he received word of this kidnapping. It wasn't necessarily as magnanimous as Gamer's concern, which seemed to be for the safe return of these abductees. France, on the other hand, was trying to kind of casually take control of things in Morocco and had approached their position there by keeping a pretty low profile to try to avoid stirring up trouble. Yeah, they had reached this agreement with Britain, and then they were just kind of trying to subtly get a little more ingrained in government bit by bit, and they did not want a big event that made it apparent that they were trying to throw their weight into the region. So having a member of the foreign community kidnapped created a whole pot of problems for French minister Georges Saint-René Talandier. And he couldn't let people get panicked, and he also didn't want to bring in the military and upset this very delicate balance that he had been trying to maintain. So he, too, asked the Moroccan government to just please give in to whatever Razuli wanted so everyone could put the whole affair behind them as quickly as possible. And he also sent his own people to negotiate directly with the kidnappers. Gumer and Nicholson even consulted Walter Harris, who was the reporter who had been captured by Razuli the year before. They wanted to see if he knew anything that might help them. But Gumer was rapidly losing hope. He wrote in his journal, quote, I cannot conceal from myself and the department that only by extremely delicate negotiations can we hope to escape from the most terrible consequences. Yeah, by that point, he was thinking, like, we maybe have, like, single-digit chance of success of getting these men back. And one of the worst aspects was that the sultan had already been trying to stop the activities of Razuli for literal years with no success. So even if the sultan got on board and was willing to take action, there was every likelihood that things were still going to fall apart. Four days after the kidnapping, Razuli's terms were relayed. Uh, What he wanted was a ransom in exchange for the return of Jan Perdicaris. He demanded 70,000 Spanish silver dollars, but that was not all. He also wanted the region known as the RIF to be cleared of all government and military personnel. He, and he wanted the government officials who had wronged him to be either dismissed or imprisoned. Further, he wanted to be made governor of two districts, which would essentially be completely free of taxation and the law of the Moroccan government. And he wanted his men to always be promised safe passage wherever they traveled in the country. This list was far more than any of the European or U.S. people involved had expected. They had kind of expected the ransom, but all of these political demands and demands for power were a little bit of a surprise. And there was literally no way that these demands could be met without hurtling Morocco even deeper into chaos. Frantic telegrams were being sent to the U.S. State Department to inquire about exactly when those promised warships might arrive. An additional demand was also sent out by Resli. He wanted both the U.S. and the British to guarantee that Morocco would fulfill the terms. So all three of these countries had to basically give him everything he was asking for, and he was asking for a lot. No country's government wanted to be on the hook for another country giving a violent terrorist everything he wanted. This cable was sent to Washington, D.C., explaining this whole new development. And of course, this story did not stay quiet, and newspapers around the globe picked it up and were reporting the incident. But the reporting tended to romanticize the whole thing. So a rich expatriate, a dangerous bandit, the U.S. Navy speeding to the rescue, it was all just too much for papers to resist. 
And they followed along with every step. When President Roosevelt got the cable about the additional demands that were being put on the United States and Britain, he decided to send the European squadron of the Navy under the command of Admiral Theodore F. Jewell into the Bay of Tangier to try to back up the South Atlantic squadron. The United States also made an official request of the French government to come assist in this matter. Yeah, even though the French government had been doing some things, they were acting independently from uh, Britain and the U.S. at that point. They were trying to clean up their own mess quietly. And at this point, the U.S. was like, hey, dudes, can you please, like, step it up here? Um, And while papers in the U.S. touted the Navy's power and boasted that if needed, they could go ashore and take Razuli by force, those on the ground in Morocco who were more familiar with the situation knew better. First, such an act would almost certainly lead to the deaths of both prisoners as well as Navy personnel. Like, they knew that caution and care had to be used. Finally, on May 30th, 1904, 12 days after the kidnapping, the first of the U.S. Navy ships finally arrived. Once his flagship, the Brooklyn, had made its way into the harbor, Admiral Chadwick met with the consul, Gamer. The two of them contacted the Moroccan foreign minister, who was Mohamed Torres, who met with them on the Brooklyn later that day. The foreign minister toured the ship and had a pretty cordial chat with the two men. But when the terms of Resley's demands came up, he was crystal clear that the Moroccan government would not give up anything. So Chadwick and Gamer were left fretting about the life of a U.S. citizen that they could not reach, nor could they negotiate for. And we're about to get to a pretty solid twist in the story, so we're going to pause here for a quick sponsor break. Just as things were getting very hand-wringy on the part of the U.S. officials in Tangier... The unique and surprising question arose as to whether Perticaris was even a U.S. citizen at all. So remember when we mentioned earlier how Eon Perticaris had left Harvard as the Civil War broke out and then he kind of tootled around Europe with seemingly no specific direction? Uh, So on June 1st of this year that everything is going down, that's 1904, the U.S. State Department received a letter from a man in North Carolina named A.H. Slocum, who claimed that he had run into Perticaris in Athens, Greece, in 1863, and that Perticaris was there, he said, to become a Greek citizen. Perticaris, it seemed, had inherited property in South Carolina from his mother's family, and it would be seized by the Confederacy if he was a U.S. citizen. Slocum was very adamant as to the accuracy of his memory in the matter and this plan that they were uh, switching his citizenship to keep his land safe. And if Perticaris was not a U.S. citizen, this whole business surrounding his kidnapping and arrest was an entirely different mess than the one that President Roosevelt thought that he had gotten into. We should point out that there's some confusion here about whether claiming citizenship in Greece would have eradicated his U.S. citizenship, or whether he would have had a dual citizenship. It was, what, like 50 years later that that the Supreme Court even ruled on such a thing? When they ruled on it, it was sort of like, this is how we've usually done it, even though it's not been in the law anywhere. (laughs) Right. But it did make things a little confusing and nutty, for sure. Yeah, and it does seem like if his whole idea was wanting to get around his property being seized, that regardless of what he was actually doing, his intent was to not be a citizen be a U.S. to citizen. protect yeah. his, yeah. Yeah, so after several days, during which there was silence on this whole matter from the White House, the U.S. minister resident in Athens was asked to perform a comprehensive search of the records available to see if there was any truth to this whole thing. And they did discover that on March 19th, 1862, not 1863, Jan Perticaris had been naturalized as a Greek citizen. Despite this revelation, which was handled very discreetly, Roosevelt and Secretary of State John Hay decided to press on as things had already been planned. There were seven U.S. naval warships at Tangier, with other countries also bringing their military aid to bear. So to go public with the news of Perticaris' citizenship status would have destabilized more than just Morocco. Additionally, uh, Roosevelt felt like Riza Lee thought that Perticaris was a U.S. citizen, so it just made sense to leave this new information alone. Finally, on June 8th, Sultan Abdelaziz gave in. He told the Moroccan government to give Rizli whatever he wanted. France, which had been putting pressure on the Sultan to resolve this issue by meeting the ransom requests, 
loaned the Moroccan government 62.5 million francs a few days later. Yeah, little little handshaky, back scratchy situation there. But carrying out Abdelaziz's orders to meet Razouli's demands also proved to be difficult. And he was not going to give up the prisoners until all of those other promises were kept. So a standoff continued, with a Navy fleet parked in the waters off Tangier and Razouli up in the mountains awaiting all that he had requested. Negotiations continued in an effort to get the brigand to understand the difficulty in carrying out the specifics of his demands, but he was utterly stalwart in his position. And Risley's refusal to budge had backed multiple governments into a corner, and he made clear that if anyone were to try to harm him, his men would kill his attackers. Things started looking up on June 19th. Uh, Consul Gomer wired a message that a release had been negotiated for the 21st, but then that deal was rescinded on the 20th. Things had reached a breaking point, and the United States, Britain, and France were all growing really frustrated with Morocco, which was promising to meet Rezali's demands, but then failing to take action to actually do it. The U.S. threatened to seize Moroccan customs if the government did not act on all of its promises. And as this whole thing was dragging on... The Republican National Convention took place in the United States from June 21st to 23rd. And Roosevelt was wildly popular, and he was certain to get the nomination, but he left nothing to chance. He had no opposition, but he still took every step to ensure that things went smoothly at the convention, and as a consequence, the convention was actually considered a rather dull affair. On the 22nd, a telegram, which is now famously quoted as being Roosevelt's words, was sent out to the press and to Morocco at the same time, and it read, quote, this government wants Perticaris alive or Rasuli dead. This was really Secretary of State John Hay who had sent this message. And the version that went to Gomer in Morocco had an additional line that the version that was sent to the press did not have. It was, quote, do not land Marines or seize customs without specific instructions. This was meant to galvanize the convention and get sentiment squarely behind Roosevelt. Yeah, it was almost like it wasn't good enough that he was going to get the nomination. He wanted everyone to really want him to have it. Uh, <laughs> so he thought that we would look very strong and that would that would get his support. It may have also made officials in Morocco feel as though decisive action was finally being taken if it were not for the fact that the release of Perticaris and his stepson Varley had already been secured by the time they got this message. They had been traded halfway down a mountain for a bag of Spanish silver dollars. After all the dust settled, Gomer was told about Perticaris' citizenship status, and the consul got a written confession from him. Ion made the case that because he had been born a U.S. citizen, he always felt that he was, and so he didn't seek out to reinstate his citizenship. The situation with his Greek citizenship was kept secret to try to protect Roosevelt, and it only came to light in a biography written about John Hay almost 30 years later in 1933. Ion Perticaris moved to England soon after this incident ended, and he later wrote of Razuli that he was, quote, one of the most interesting and kindly-hearted Native gentlemen, and that he and Varley had been treated kindly throughout their capture. And he also went on to advocate for Razuli to be given control of northern Morocco. Because of his ongoing praise of the man who kidnapped him long after this whole incident was over, Perticaris is often characterized as having had Stockholm Syndrome, although that term was not actually coined until 1973. He did continue to write about Morocco after he had left, giving his opinion on the politics and the cultural complexities of a country that was being ruled largely by outsiders. He died in London in 1925. And Razuli was given the positions of power that he had asked for uh, after this whole thing, and his people were freed from prison. But he was ousted in 1906 due to serious corruption. He was not any better at running things than the people that he had been trying to overthrow. Sultan Abdelaziz was also deposed in 1907 and was replaced by his older brother. A book of letters written to Ellen Perticaris during the time that her husband and son were hostages is in the Tangier American Legation, which is now a museum and cultural center. Yeah, they're all things that are along the general lines of, I saw the news, I am so sorry, please, what can I do for you? But it's she has all of these amazing letters from really notable people, uh, so it's kind of an interesting historical record of that moment. Do you also have some listener mail to take us out? I do, and I am so excited about this particular piece of listener mail. 
Um, it is from our listener, Carrie, and she writes, Dear Holly and Tracy, I am a huge fan. You ladies keep me company during so many of my daily activities. I can't thank you enough for all the work you do. Last February, my daughter asked to go on a school field trip to the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh with a friend. To keep it short, it was amazing. We had the opportunity to hear two survivor stories, one from a daughter of a survivor and the other from a survivor himself, and both were incredible. The center also has a rotating exhibit and at the time was featuring... Chutzpah, superheroes of the Holocaust. Stories of upstanders, heroes, and survivors told in the form of a comic book. One of the talented artists was there to talk with the kids, and it just so happened that I had met him a few years earlier during a Girl Scout field trip at Pittsburgh's Tunesium. I was so enthralled by this concept, I wanted to share it with you both. So she sent us a signed copy of the collection of comics, uh, along with a, a, a little... Uh, press release style printout from the center's website uh, that goes into detail about what it is. These are so amazing. So again, this is the Holocaust Center of the Jewish Federation of Greater Pittsburgh, which put this whole thing together. And it is all of these artists telling the stories of all of these amazing people during the Holocaust. Again, it is called Chutzpow, so that's C-H-U-T-Z dash pow, P-O-W. Uh, and it is amazing. And the art is really lovely. I really like the art styles in here. And these stories are very moving. It's a number of different art styles because a lot of different artists worked on it. It's so fantastic. I hope everybody seeks it out uh, because what a great way to examine history and and record it. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you to the very wonderful Carrie for sharing this with us because I had not heard about it and now I am in love with it because I love comics as well as history. Uh, if you would like to write to us, you can do so at historypodcast at howstuffworks.com. You can also find us everywhere on social media as Missed in History. And you can visit our website, mistinhistory.com, where we have show notes and uh, episodes going all the way back to the beginning of the show and things that you can click on, like that trip to Paris information and our uh, our store. And we also hope that you subscribe to the podcast, which you can do on the iHeartRadio app, at Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 